Pro-Life Talk. Real world answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report. I'm your host, Josh Brom, and I'm here with a very special guest, someone I've been wanting to get on the show for quite some time, Jojo Ruba, the executive director at Faith Beyond Belief, who organizes events and training opportunities to help Christians to better understand and share their Christian worldview. Uh, I, I, I saw Jojo first, or Jojo kind of came on my radar several years ago when a YouTube video went viral of Jojo back when he was working at Canada CBR with Stephanie Gray doing a an abortion debate at this university in Canada. I forget which one. And uh, why don't don't you just tell us a little bit about what happened, just so that people get a little idea of what what you've been through being a pro-life advocate. Well, I I was going to say there's two of them. I don't know which one you're referring to. I don't know. I've seen one of them. You're being shouted (laughs) down for like 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, there's that was probably the one in Atlantic Canada, which is just north of Maine in Nova Scotia. And uh, I spoke there. They told us protesters would be coming. And I said, that's fine. Let them protest. That's okay. We we had booked the room. The pro-life students had booked the room. The chaplaincy was working with them. And I just started my presentation, even as I was about to say, you know, your opinions are welcome. You're welcome to share your questions, but just make sure you ask at the end. As soon as I finished saying that, they started chanting for about 45 minutes, not letting me speak. They started blocking the cameras. Uh, the uh, It was a campus a security officer. She was around there that evening, heard that this was happening. The police came and were about to arrest her, uh, this person blocking the camera. So the campus security person uh, called it off and made us leave the campus, but not the protesters. So we were forced off campus to a church nearby, even though that was our room that was booked for that evening for the pro-life students. And then about a year later, I spoke at McGill University in Quebec, that's uh, near Massachusetts, north of Massachusetts, and they tried to do the same thing. And they they actually chanted for about 45 minutes. They did all 99 verses of 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Yeah, that's not the one I saw. (laughs) (laughs) And not the best thing to do. Uh, They sang Amazing Grace. Uh, at least the first verse, they couldn't figure out what the second verse was. <laughs> it's but, you know, at both incidences, Josh, and this is what I love about learning these kinds of things, about being bold in these situations, is honest people at places, even pro-choice people, stayed around despite the protests to listen to my presentation. One young lady who was a, a, a lesbian, who was pro-choice at the first university, she actually came with us to the Catholic Church where I finished my presentation. And during Q&A, she said, I feel so uncomfortable here, but I want to ask you this question. And she asked an honest question about illegal abortion. And when I told her that pro-lifers actually don't support illegal abortion either, we want all of them to be stopped, I think that completely changed her perspective. And even on the other campus, one of the young men who had been protesting when the police silenced them for about 20 minutes and by dragging two of them away, I actually got a chance to speak a little bit, but they started again. But uh, even at the end there, as I finished up the the, the lecture, uh, the, the protesters went away. He actually came to me on his own and said, you know, what you told me or what you said, little I heard made sense. I wish I could have heard more. At which point I would have, I wanted to, to say, well, you shouldn't have been protesting then. You could have stopped. But, but that's the point, though. It's really truth is on our side on these things. And one of the key things that I've learned doing pro-life work, and I want to apply in my Christian apologetics field now, is that frankly, we don't have enough bold Christians. We don't have people who aren't intimidated by this culture and who can graciously and lovingly but uncompromisingly speak the truth that this culture desperately needs. And I I think that was the key thing is as a Christian, obviously I come from a Christian organization now, the one thing that kept going through my head, and it was the Holy Spirit reminding me that these people are people that God loves, and God loves them enough to tell them the truth. And that's the key point. I need to be there. I need to be strong in being there and speaking something that's uncomfortable because they need it, because God loves them. And that's what real tolerance, that's what real love actually looks like. It's being unpopular because people are not needing that person to step up. 
we're going to be doing two episodes with Jojo. Uh, ne- ne- next week, we're going to talk more about what, what faith beyond belief is. But today, just to kind of get to know him, we're going to ask Jojo the same nine questions that we've asked a bunch of other, what we kind of jokingly call pro-life celebrities. On our show <laughs> is a, a questionnaire that we designed so that we could learn from different people who have come from different experiences and different backgrounds. If we ask everyone the same questions, and we can kind of compare and contrast what answers uh, that they have and, and what things tend to be you know, common and, and patterns and, and what questions do we tend to get a, a large, uh, a, a lot of diversity. And so we're going to uh, just jump into that now. So just <laughs> as a way to get to know you, Jojo, what did you get in trouble for as a child? Oh, my gosh, this is terrible. <laughs> you know what? I actually was a little kleptomaniac when I was about like seven or eight years old. Oh, and no. I stole glue once and I stole like a little, some toy cars from the, I think it was the Wolco. It was, it was way back. It was where, well, the pre Walmart here in Canada. Right. And my brother tattled on me and I got in big trouble. And my parents said, you know, you can get arrested, you're going to go to jail. And I felt so bad. I never stole again. So that was the one time that I actually got in trouble. The one time. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Jojo, what is your favorite movie and why? Or a favorite movie? A favorite movie. You know what? Despite the fact that it's really long, I have to say The Hiding Place. With, by, by the story of Tor, uh, Corey Ten Boom. It's, it's an awesome story. Well, my favorite scene, or my least favorite but most compelling scene, is when Corey's family is sitting out for, for tea and they're clockmakers and their pastor is visiting. And as their pastor is visiting, uh, a man comes in and he has this heavy jacket on and, and he comes and makes sure no one else is there, closes the door and then opens a Jacket, a Jewish baby, and he offers this baby to the ten booms, knowing they're Christians, and and they're, they play, start playing with him, and they're just so enthralled. And then the pastor says, "But you're not going to keep it, are you?" It's just po- just a powerful line, and and the the ten booms, particularly Corey and her sister, are horrified. How can how can she even say that? And they even say, "Well, pastor, you live in a farmhouse. Why don't you take the baby?" And the pastor's response is so indicative, I think, of where so many Christians are on the abortion issue. Uh, he says, well, what about my church? What about my congregation? I'm risking my family for all the life of, of this one Jewish child. And Corey's uh, dad says, well, Jesus was Jewish, wasn't he? Don't we serve him? Don't we care about his life? And the pastor says, well, you know, curses or blessings on you. It's up to you and leaves. And, and Corey's dad has a great line. He says, well, you know, sometimes... Uh, what's in the cookie jar isn't just cookies, but mice who crawl in. And I, I think that's such a, a powerful scene. I often use it in my presentations just to remind us that every great crisis throughout history, every time um, there's great evil, it's an opportunity for God's people to do great good. And and I think that's where we have to realize this uh, this abortion debate, this whole thing about life not being valued, it's really God calling us to do great good. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the pro-life movement, and this will be interesting. You're the first person from Canada that I've brought on to do this interview, so I, I don't know what, how much of a difference there is between the pro-life movement in America or in Canada, or if you just see it as one great movement. I, I guess we'll kind of find out as you answer these questions. But my first one is this. What has been the pro-life movement's greatest victory or victories so far? <laughs> In Canada, uh, part of the reason why it's a little different is because criminal law is federal here. So unlike in the U.S., you can have 50 different states with different laws you can experiment. If you win a state government, say in a more conservative-leaning state, you have a chance to pass some laws that can gain popularity. In Canada, we don't do that. We, we have a, a federal system where criminal law affecting abortion uh, is based solely on the federal government. So you have to win the federal government to do that. And frankly, we haven't had many victories on the political side at all. Uh, We actually had a province um, run a a ballot, a a referendum to defund abortion there because in Canada, abortion is not only legal throughout all nine months of pregnancy, abortion is publicly funded for all nine months of pregnancy. And in most provinces, if not all of them, a woman can get a late-term abortion by flying into the U.S. And her abortion, as well as her flight to the U.S., is publicly funded. So we have, we have basically the worst case possible scenario. 
when it comes to the, the the federal law side of things, we we haven't had any victories, frankly, in a long time. And in fact, uh, that's one of the things that I actually see a bright hope for because recently the abortion debate has come back to the forefront. Even though the, our, the media elite here, the political elite here have all said the debate is over, stop talking about it. We are now seeing a resurgence of pro-life activists who I can, I, honestly say, I've learned the apologetics that Scott Klusendorf and our friends from the U.S. have brought up and, and really got them to critically think about these issues. In fact, I have a friend who's an atheist who's still pro-life and she's trying to organize pro-life atheists here because we've focused so much on the secular arguments that I think are good arguments to bind people together, to build a coalition around. And, and I, I strongly believe that that's one of the, the key reasons why the resurgence of the movement here. Uh, as well, some of us are beginning to ask some important questions, which is what is it that we want to do politically? The, the leaders of the pro-life movement on the political side in Canada have been all or nothing kind of people. And, and I don't want to say that disparagingly. I'm trying to be fair to but in a, in a federation, federation like ours, which is what Canada is, that's a very difficult position to be because basically the political party that's in power will always try to build a broad coalition and not want to listen to just one part of it. And because there's two left-wing parties here and only one right-wing one, the left-wing parties aren't very open to the pro-life view. Uh, and they can often get a enough of a coalition if they wanted to, to, to win the pro-abortion side of things. But that that's also starting to be questioned. And I think what's important with that, regardless of where you stand on the incremental side of things, is that they're actually starting to think strategy now. It's not just merely let's go and be pro-life because we're right about this. They're starting to think, well, how can we get from here to where we're at to a place where abortion is actually unthinkable and where the law helps with that rather than as the final outcome? That's excellent news. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the opposite question then. Um, what do you think has been the pro-life movement's greatest weakness so far? Well, I think part of our weakness is the weakness of, of the church in general here is that we haven't adapted to the postmodern culture that's really been um, epitomized by the slogan our prime minister in 1969 said. He said, the stage has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. And that was to mean when he legalized homosexuality, birth control, divorce, and abortion. It was all in one bill. He wanted to, to symbolize how Canada has become a liberalized country. We, we don't um, spend our time and stick our noses in where we don't want to. But of course, it's an ironic statement because every bedroom in Canada has, is regulated by the federal government or the provincial government in terms of what they can use for fabrics or wall or whatever. All that wow. stuff is still regulated. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's that's the point. Government is everywhere. My, my in political science, and I, I don't say that to boast necessarily, but when I studied in Ottawa, I, I realized just how big the government here is in Canada. So in terms of weakness, the pro-life movement hasn't adapted to being able to speak to that culture. What, what's basically been happening is as good Christian people, we've come and said, you know, abortion is wrong. We believe it takes the life of a human child. It's murder. All of those things are, are true, but it's how you explain it to a postmodern who doesn't understand what truth means and who says, well, that's just true for you. And so for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been sort of struggling to get our message across. And I, I've met many, many pro-life leaders who were active, say, in the 80s or even the 70s who burnt out, especially after the law. Um, in 1988, the Supreme Court struck down the only abortion law that existed. And we've actually had no law on abortion since that time, none whatsoever. So abortion is legal throughout all nine months of pregnancy for any reason or no reason at all. Where the other countries that with no law are countries like Cuba, North Korea, and China. Um, and even the US, even though they don't have a law either because of Roe and Doe, uh, at least you have some state protections. Like in Ontario, where I used to live, you have to be about 16 years old to get a Tylenol without your parents' permission. But you can get an abortion at 11 years old and the government will pay for that abortion and your parents won't even have to know. So. I think part of the this weaknesses that we've had is we've just been trying to be right for so long instead of explaining why we're right and explain why people should hold our position as well. 
So, um, like I said, I think that's changing, but but I think it's slow change, and, and it's also one where we still have to think, well, what can we do to move the discussion forward? And, and that's where the challenge, particularly in the churches, because for many Christians, they still have the mindset that I'm opposed to abortion for me. And that's actually buying into the postmodern mindset rather than trying to challenge it. Graphic pictures, should mm. we use them? And if so, how, when, and where? Right. Well, uh, since my background, as you mentioned, is with the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, I'm actually one of the co-founders here in Canada. Uh, my position hasn't changed for, since I worked there. I think when you look at... Um, movements like Greenpeace, environmentalists, the animal rights activists. At my campus in, in my university, they actually had on, in the tunnels a large picture of a woman who was a, a victim of spousal abuse. And, and that tells me that even these secular movements understand the power of images in a visual culture. In fact, one of the most popular things I just posted on Facebook is of a truck that they were driving around. I think it was during the NBA playoffs. Uh, and it was a, they had actually put women in there. I think right. you've seen the video you know, who are victims of, of uh, human trafficking. And you could see the faces of people as they're, they're trying to enjoy themselves. But these women who are probably just actors, right? They're, they're in there to, to portray what happened. Uh, they, they see the result of what human trafficking actually is. And I don't think anyone in that video or anyone watching it ever complain, at least not on my Facebook page, about how horrible to show those graphic images, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to abortion, it seems that that's changed. Um, and I, I really think that much of that discussion of graphic images has to do with, well, what are we guilty for? Right. And we can look at pictures of human trafficking or seal hunts and say, that's a bad thing. We should not do that and not be mad at the people showing the images because we're not responsible. But because we, we know we are culpable, even through our taxpayers here in Canada, as tax money in Canada, um, we don't want to talk about it. In fact, I just had two Christians on my Facebook page yesterday complain about graphic images and, and children seeing them. And my response to that is, look, we don't want children to see them either, but give us a venue where uh, parents and adults and teens can see these images and children won't be available and won't be there. And, and these people will stay and will actually want to listen and see these images on their own or learn about this issue. And we'll choose that venue instead. We'll be glad to go there. Uh, what's, but, but since they're not doing that, what's our alternative? How can we get them to see those images? You know, the most powerful, I think, example of that is still the fact that if you think about human history, all the, all the suffering that's happened, many of the people who come from different parts of the world, uh, who come to Canada, when they see the graphic images, they're actually not phased. It's the Canadians who are nice and tolerant, who never want to talk about anything difficult, who are the ones who are always angry. But the people who come from other parts of the world who've seen poverty, who've seen war, who've seen torture, when they see the images, they're not mad. They sometimes have questions. We even had parents with little kids um, who come to us when we're holding these signs on the street and they actually bring their little children to educate them on abortion. And they say things like, this is what happens with abortion. That's why it's wrong. So. Uh, Really, the response, if you think about what's at stake versus what needs to be done, the, the concern about graphic images often boils down to, I don't like seeing them. Let me ask you a, a follow-up question, just because uh, I, I think I think you'll have a good answer to this, but I'm, I'm sure this is something that's going on in the mind of, pe of some people listening. Um, they was, you know, I think uh, hopefully everybody has seen that amazing video of the, of the glass truck. Um, with uh, on, on human trafficking, um, uh, but I imagine some people would say, you know, there's kind of a difference between disturbing images and graphic images. You mm -hmm. know, in the truck, yeah, no one complained about that because while it was it was disturbing and very sad, if you kind of understand um, the you know what's going on be behind the you know the the stories of of the women that are being portrayed. Um, that, that, you know, like parents are probably not going to be upset about their kids seeing that truck. They can just choose not to tell them about, you know, everything about what's going on there. Whereas they might say that there's a difference between kind of gory or bloody um, images of, of dead bodies. Kind of what, what, what would your, be, your, your response be to that? Well, you know, I, I would agree there is a little bit of a difference for sure. Uh, but if you're talking about really young children, most of the young children who've seen these images that I've talked to, uh, don't even know what's going on. 
Like we even have angry, we've had people who've called who are angry who said, why is there a frog on that truck? Or why is there a frog on that picture? Because they just don't know. And in fact, all the, all the kids who handled it badly have handled it badly because their parents are angry and upset and swearing. So uh, I remember when, when I worked for CCBR, we actually had a call from a man who was so angry with the images because his daughter saw them. And as he's leaving his angry message on her answering machine, he's swearing a storm, up right, a storm. Right. So you're thinking, well, if you're upset about your child seeing that, well, you're not upset about your child hearing how you're speaking about it right now. Um, so in terms of disturbing and gory, yeah, no, I, I think you're right. There's a bit of a difference and I, I'd be glad to concede that, but I'm not sure how that, how that difference matters in terms of the situation. When we're talking about trafficking, it's something that's already illegal and we're trying to just educate people on it and trying to help people understand what's happening and be concerned. When we're talking about abortion, we're talking about the deaths in Canada of 300 children every day. That's over 100,000 every year. Uh, and in fact, the government is so committed to covering it up, they won't even release the actual numbers anymore. Uh, abortion clinics and hospitals in, in at least three of the major provinces in Canada don't release the numbers of how many abortions they're performing. So that's the kind of commitment they have to cover it up. That means we have to have the same commitment to expose it. And, and I, I really think that's where the key difference is. When we talk about human trafficking, there are many ways to get people who are already on board to mobilize them. With the pro-life side, the reason why it's gory, because, well, abortion is gory, but we're also trying to not just mobilize people, we're trying to activate their consciences so that they actually become pro-life as well. Okay, this one's really important to me personally. How should pro-life people interact with those who are pro-abortion choice? Well, abortion advocates are people who are living human beings, and therefore, as pro-lifers, we have to respect their lives as well, don't we? Uh -huh. uh, you know, ultimately, the best example of a pro-life case or the pro-life message is from someone who actually was pro-abortion and has now become pro-life, I think. And people like Abby Johnston or, or, or um, uh, pro-life doctors who have once performed abortions in the past, I think they can share a powerful testimony of not only how the pro-life position is true, but how we really believe in redemption. And, and that's what we want to be able to portray in this uh, movement is that whether you've had an abortion or have been involved in one, that doesn't change the fact that your life and your child's life is valuable. That's why we exist as a movement. So get practical. When you're training um, students to go out on campus and talk to people, whether you're doing you know, Christian apologetics or whether you're, you're you know, talking about the, the, the abortion issue, um, practically, can I, what kind of uh, tips or advice are you offering to students to help them to treat um, pro-choice people or atheists the way that you want them to be treated? Well, one of the key things I do, and, and I like teaching people this as well, is just stop yourself. And even in the middle of the conversation, as you're listening to the person speak, say a little prayer. And the prayer is this, Father, show me how I can love this person today. And, and that always humbles me, especially when I'm in the middle of a really hot debate or I've, I've, I'm even online and debating people. And I remind myself, God, this, this person needs your love. How can I show that love? And, and the, what's key with that, Josh, is that you remember love is not wimpy. Love is not about being nice. I, I've looked through the Bible, I've not found that verse that says, thou shalt be nice. And that's a really sad thing for Canadians because we're super nice. That's one of the inbred things about our genetics. But, but one of the key things to remember that is love means being able to, at the drop of a hat, and this obviously takes practice, but to know when to put an arm around someone's shoulder and cry with them or to kick them in the butt and say, hey, grow up. And I remember there was a debate I did at uh, the University of British Columbia, and there was a Christian lady who came up, and she was just so angry. She was, she was trying to defend her Christian view and her pro-abortion view. And I just was trying to argue with her intellectually. And, and I have to admit, I don't remember if I actually prayed that that time. And, and at the end of it, I just felt so frustrated because I couldn't get through with her. But fortunately, one of the young ladies from the pro-life group came and talked to her afterwards. Turns out she helped a friend have an abortion. And she was trying to justify that to me. And, and if I had just simply listened and talked to her in the way that she needed to be heard, then I think I would have been able to make her better. And, and you know, Jesus was brilliant at that. I mean, as, again, as a Christian apologist now, I can point to Jesus' example. And when he talks, he talks to people and meets them where they're at, exposes their need, and talks it to them at a level they understand. So when Jesus talks to the rich young ruler and tells him to sell everything he has, 
that isn't what he says to the widow or the woman caught in adultery. But he, he does that because he knows that's what that young man is struggling with. And when he failed to respond in a positive way, walked away angry, that didn't make Jesus a bad apologist or a bad evangelist, but it made him someone who truly cared enough to tell that young man the truth he needed to hear. And, and so all of the tactics and training and strategy, and there's obviously so much more that I give, uh, starts with that point. What is your motivation to talk to this person? Do you really care for this person? Or are you just trying to prove yourself right? Hmm. And that, that changes your motivation entirely. Love that. Okay, last question. What single thing should pro-lifers be doing that most are not doing right now? Be willing to offend. I think that really summarizes it as well. So much of our tactics and strategy is based on the notion that success means the person we're talking to likes us at the end of the day. And, and that's not the case. If Jesus was liked at the end of the day, he wouldn't have been crucified. If the apostles were liked at the end of the day, they would not have all been martyred or one left in jail to rot to death. So ultimately, part of our problem is we're so stuck in being secure of, of choosing strategies that make us feel better at the end of the day instead of helping people be better at the end of the day. And, and, and one of the things I, I've realized is I'm the kind of person who likes to connect with everyone. I love having lots of friends. You can see all my friends on Facebook and I connect them all. And I, even growing up, I remember it, my high school friends had a, a civil war in my class and half of them didn't like the other half. But I was one of the few people who was in the middle and still friends with both. So this is hard for me too. But, but I realized, gosh, caring for people means that I need to say things that no one else is going to because they need to hear it. And, and I think as pro-lifers, we've done that for too long. We, we've stopped thinking about what the person needs and start, started thinking about how they feel. You know, good strategy is probably the second part of that. If you have a situation where uh, abortion advocates are yelling at you or accusing you of having a war on women, challenge that. Be bold and, and, and say, what do you mean by that? Well, who do you think the pro-life leaders are? Do you really think the right to choose to kill your child makes a woman equal to a man? And is, is that what you're actually advocating for? Those are the kinds of bold statements, I think, particularly in the political realm that your candidates need to start making. They can't let the other side define the issues for them. And so the, those kinds of ideas, I think, are so key. Christians, uh, especially those who are not active in the pro-life movement, they have to realize that the Christian worldview is just that. God is God of every aspect of our life. And so if you're not talking about issues like abortion or homosexuality, then you're not actually talking about a Christian worldview. And that actually violates the Great Commission, which where Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I have commanded you. So the pro-life movement is should be the Christian movement. It should be the movement where Christians should be involved, though others, of course, are welcome. We, we want to welcome them as well, but we should be the leaders. We should be out there making sure that God's message of good news, that he loves every person, including those not born yet, including the abortion doctors, is being heard in our secular culture. Jojo Ruba is the executive director of Faith Beyond Belief. You can check out their website at faithbeyondbelief.ca. Uh, Jojo, I'm looking forward to our next episode with you. Thanks for being on with us. Sounds good, Josh. Remember, you can have a great impact on any conversation if you remember to ask good questions, listen to understand, and find genuine common ground when possible. That's our show. Now go talk to someone. You've been watching Life Report, pro-life talk, real world answers. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org.